Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, if you got this far, that means you've successfully navigated your way through the beginning of this online course and you've made it to the first lecture video. Uh, just to warn you a little bit, uh, this might be a little boring for some, especially if you've taken your previous math class fairly recently. So this, this video is just all about review of, I guess, pre-algebra and things that you should have learned in your previous class, although some people don't learn it and it's good to have seen it. Um, and even if you have seen it, it's good to review it. Uh, so let's see, what are we starting with here? It's kind of just a, a big mix of all kinds of topics. So if it seems kind of disjointed and random, it's because they just kind of, uh, you know, this, this chapter just throws in a lot of things that you should know that... Anyway, so... Um, I guess we'll start from the beginning, just kind of some definitions that you probably already know, but it's always good to refresh. Let's see, the first one is we're defining what a variable is up here at the top left corner. Um, a variable is a letter or symbol which represents a number, which you've probably heard the word variable over and over and over um, in your math classes. But so for example, if in this expression here, 60 plus 2z, the z is the variable because it's a letter, or it could be a symbol, that represents a number, but it's typically a letter. And then this one, I don't know if you've heard this as often, but it's equally as important. Um, and in expressions such as this, the one that we just boxed up here, a constant, it's a number that's in an expression or an equation that does not change. So think of it just as a number. It's a number that's maybe adding or subtracting with a variable or a variable multiplied by a number. Um, but you notice, if you think about it, no matter what z is, let's say you substitute a value for z, let's say 3. If you put 3 in for z, that's not going to affect 60 here. 60 will always be 60. It's the, the portion to the right of the plus sign that might change. So that's why it's called a constant, because it won't change no matter what the variable is. Um, so what else? An algebraic expression, you've probably heard, we've kind of even, even used the word expression up here a little bit. Um, an expression, it just consists of a variable, like we have up here, the z, and or numbers. Maybe there are numbers, maybe it's just a variable. And you often see, especially in the more complicated expressions, the symbols, you know, are, are typical adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing symbols. Um, along with grouping symbols, which all that means is either parentheses or brackets, something like that. So here we have an example of an expression. It's just a variable right there in the middle of the parentheses, multiplied by a number, there's some subtraction, there's some parentheses, there's some brackets, all kinds of operation symbols. You got adding, subtracting, dividing, that kind of thing. So I'm sure you've seen that before. Um, but I guess what we really want to point out here is the difference between that, an algebraic expression, and an algebraic equation. So really all you have to do to an algebraic expression to change it to an algebraic equation is to just insert a equal sign in it. So notice that this portion, the 5 all the way through the 9, is the same down here in the algebraic expression. I just added an equal sign and then a few you know, interesting things to the right of the equal sign. So as soon as you see an equal sign, you know it's an equation as, a, as a, opposed to an expression. So I guess the big difference is in this class and in your next math class, you'll be seeing both of these kind of off and on. Algebraic expressions, all you can hope to do is simplify them. So you can make them look prettier or maybe make them look less complicated, that kind of thing. But an algebraic equation, those are ones that we'll actually be able to solve. You know, we'll figure out what x is. We're able to because of the equal sign. So that's the big difference. <laughs> A lot of people think, well, how come sometimes we simplify, sometimes we solve? I don't understand why. So really it's just the absence of the equal sign makes it so we can only simplify, and the presence of an equal sign makes it so we can solve. So anyway, if you already knew that, I know you're probably bored, but maybe we'll move on to something more interesting. What else do we have here? So here in this example, we're given an expression, 5ab plus 7, and they want us to evaluate it for a equals negative 2 and b equals 6. So you probably already have an idea of what that means, or you can guess. They just want us to take this expression here, 5a plus, or sorry, 5ab plus 7, and replace the a with negative 2, replace the b with 6, 
and then see what kind of happens. Be careful. Maybe, I think, and especially if you ever, you're substituting values in for variables, I would always use parentheses for them. So where the A was, I'm putting parentheses, negative 2. And then where the B was, I'm putting parentheses 6. Just because it kind of makes it more clear what you're doing. You know, when you see things next to each other, like this 5, the negative 2, and the 6, we know to multiply them because they're next to each other. But if I had just written 5, 2, 6, it would look like 526 instead of 5 multiplied by, you know, etc. So parentheses are always important to really show yourself and someone else what you're doing and what the operation is. So let's see. Because of order of operations, I would definitely multiply these together first before I try to add 7. Because in order of operations, which we'll talk about soon, um, you're supposed to multiply before you add. And I'm, I might as well multiply from left to right. Let's see. we got... 5 times negative 2, okay, that'd be negative 10. Negative 10 times 6 would be negative 60. Okay, that's, oops, excuse me. That's just the, the, the left portion. Now I'm going to add the 7. Sometimes if I'm really tired, I'll forget to do that last step. <laughs> you know, I thought, you know, multiplying those three numbers, that took a lot of brain power. I'm probably done by now. But no, I had one more step. I have to add the 7. That's negative 53 if, if I added right there, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow all the complicated algebra we do, adding and subtracting seems to be the most <laughs> the thing I have the most difficulty with. I know that's sad, but I feel feel like I can admit it to you guys. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. Please let me know if anything doesn't make sense. You know, email me or yeah, something just I'd like to know if things aren't clear. So here, the next example we have, I think it's a, it's a similar thing where really they could, in this example, they could just say, here, evaluate this equation. And this time it's an equation because there's an equal sign for b equals 10 and h equals 3.5. They could have just said that, but I think they want to show you that evaluating expressions that have variables for specific values of the variable have applications in real life. So in this example, they're saying, okay, we have a triangle. And we know the formula for the area of a triangle. It's one half times the base times the height. Well, let's say we have this specific triangle where the base has length 10 feet and the height has length 3.6 feet. Let's find the area. Well, all we have to do is substitute those values in for B and H in the formula, and we should be good to go. But again, this is just kind of forcing us to use an application of this just to show that this is kind of useful in geometry and... Um, Oh yeah, and then applications of geometry. So let's see, now I have to you know, go back and remember, how do you multiply a fraction by a whole number here? Because I got 1 half times 10. Maybe I want to take care of that first. Because you, know, you notice that you're multiplying three numbers. It's usually just easiest to go from left to right. So I've got to remember, when I'm multiplying a fraction, like 1 half multiplied by a whole number, 10, what I want to do is change the whole number to a fraction. And if you remember, you're always free to do that as long as you put the whole number over 1. So now I'm ch I kept the 1 half the same. It's the 10 that I'm changing to 10 over 1. And, you know, while I'm at it, I might as well do that to the 3.6 as well. So he's kind of, he feels like he's involved in the process too. I don't want anyone to feel left out here, right? Let's see. Now we can just go ahead, if you want, we can multiply across. Because if you remember, um, when you're multiplying fractions... They do not have to have the same denominator. That's only when you're adding or subtracting fractions. So yeah, we can just go ahead and multiply across on the top. We got the 1 times the 10, which is 10. 10 times 3.6 is 360. So that's our numerator. That's the three numerators multiplied together. And then over the denominators, we have 2 times 1 times 1. That makes 2. So we have this fraction here. And I, I would leave it as a fraction if this didn't reduce, but it definitely reduces. This I can just think of as the numerator 360 divided by the denominator 2, which 2 into 360 is 180, I believe. Yeah, sounds good. And I should probably, you know, I, I wouldn't mark you guys down for this, like on an exam or a quiz or something, but because this is an application and they specifically told us that the lengths of the sides are 10 feet and 3.6 feet, I should probably specify that the answer is in square feet since it's area. So just so you know, I think in your, you know, in your upper math classes, once you take 
the math class after this and maybe after that, they're probably going to expect you to say things like that. Like, you know, if they specify the units of measurement, then you better give them units of measurement back, that kind of thing. But, you know, for now, just good to keep in mind, but I won't, I wouldn't mark you down for that. All right, I think we're doing pretty good here. It's kind of tough because I don't hear feedback. It's, <laughs> it's not like in a regular classroom people can stop and say, hey, I don't get it, or yes, I do. Go slower, go faster. <laughs> so hopefully this is all making sense and it's not too boring. We've got a nice little picture of a triangle here that keeps it interesting, right? Not really, but <laughs> let's keep going. <laughs> the next example, this, this is probably something that even if, you know, this is all review for you, it's probably good to work on a little bit because a lot of people have a tough time translating, you know, words into math. If they, they give you an expression, can you, or, you know, a verbal expression, can you write it as a mathematical expression? Or they ask you an equation, can you rewrite it as a mathematical equation? So here are some examples. Um, let's see, they want us to translate the following phrases into algebraic expressions. I think the main thing to keep in mind is you want to give... Let's see, give a variable to what you don't know, I guess. So and it does, it's up to you. These are kind of open-ended. You can say, oh, I like, I don't know, the letter F because my name's Frank or whatever it is. But, you know, usually in math we use X just because it's kind of traditional. So I'm going to say let X be whatever the unknown is, you know, the unknown value in each, whichever part I'm looking at here. So... In part A, it looks like they're saying six less than my dog's weight in pounds. So I think in pounds, all they're saying is in the end, they want you to give them some kind of algebraic expression, and they just want you to kind of reiterate that the unit they're using is pounds. So that, the pounds won't be part of my algebraic expression. That'll just be kind of at the end. So if someone's reading this, they'll know what units are being used. But other than that, I think the thing I don't know here is the dog's weight. I'm going to call that X. Um, and six less than, okay, that's actually kind of a confusing thing because six less than, I, I know it's probably subtraction, but the thing is, is it my dog's weight minus six or is it six minus my dog's weight? And for some reason, for me, and I feel like for a lot of people, when you put things in terms of money, things make a lot of sense. So I always think, okay, if I had six fewer, or you know, six less dollars than someone, is that the amount of money they have minus six, or six minus the amount of money they have. No, I think it's the amount of money they have minus six. Because like if they had $50 and I have six less, I'd have 50 minus six. So I think that makes sense. So it looks like it's the dog's weight minus six, six less than. All right, I think that's good. So the, the pounds are not as important. It's mostly this that they want, this X minus six. That's really the, the algebraic expression they're looking for. <laughs> it's almost like the pounds are there just to confuse us, but don't worry about it too much. So let's see, what about the next one here? The next one says 22 more than a number. This one, because they're not talking about something very specific, I think it's pretty clear that the thing I don't know is that number. So I know that's going to be X. 22 more, that sounds like you're adding. So that's something I can say. I think this one's similar to the last one, it's just that it's a plus. Because if I, again, somehow money makes things make sense. If I had 22 more dollars than you, I'd have the same as you, whatever that is, X, plus 22 more. So I think that makes sense. And the thing, the good thing about addition is no matter if I put X plus 22 or 22 plus X, that would actually be the same thing. Because remember, when you add two numbers, it doesn't matter what order they're in. But subtraction is very particular. If I switch those, 6 minus X, that's a totally different number. Yeah, so be careful with subtraction. Addition is a lot more forgiving. Um, but just kind of once you get used to the language, you know, six less than, 22 more than, it gets a little better. It's it's the language that's kind of confusing. All right, so next one. This I think we're getting the hang of this here. How about triple? Triple a day's wage in dollars. So again, this is kind of similar to the first one. The dollars doesn't really matter. It's more what comes after the dollars that we care about. So when you triple something, I guess, what are you doing to that number? I think you're multiplying by three, right? When you triple something. Yeah, that makes sense. And so what am I tr multiplying by three here? The day's wages, which I guess, suppose that's the thing we don't know here. So I think 3x sounds good. Yeah, sounds good. Triple my day's wages. Yeah. 
And if you want to be more interesting, I'm not very interesting. <laughs> you could say 3W, you know, W for wages or something interesting like that. And then for part B, you could have said 22 more than a number. Oh, a number could be N, N for number. You know, but I'm boring, so I always keep it X. Sorry, guys. Um, how about the next one? The length of the table. I'm assuming that's something I don't know. I'll call that X. In feet, which, again, feet, that part doesn't matter too much. It's the rest that matters. Divided by 6. Okay, actually, this one I like the way they phrase it, because they kind of phrase it exactly as I would write it. I'm thinking, okay, it starts with an X. There's something about X. Divided by 6. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Just It seems too easy, but I think that's it. X divided by 6. You could write it as a fraction, because if you remember, um, a fraction, the numerator over the denominator, another way to think of that is the numerator divided by the denominator. So this is perfectly fine, or if you thought of the actual division symbol, you know, x divided by 6. That's perfectly fine, too. I wouldn't say one's more or less correct than the other. I think they're both perfect. So if you thought of either of those, you're, you're doing great. Okay, let's see the next one. The next one says 11 days more than twice ooh, the number of days until Sally's birthday. All right, they're getting more complicated here, you guys. We've got to be careful. I'm assuming, though, that the number of days until Sally's birthday is something I don't know. So that whole expression there, or that, you know, that whole phrase, I'm just going to call it X. Um, and this might be one where, as, as these get more and more complicated, and we'll see that, I think what I want to do is maybe read a little bit at a time, dissect it, and write down what I know, and then read a little more, write down what I can write down, and et cetera, et cetera. So I think I'll start at the beginning. At the very beginning, they say... 11 days more. I'm just going to stop there. I remember in part B, when I said 22 more, I added 22 to something. I added it on the right side. So I'm thinking on this one, since it's 11 days more, this is probably something plus 11. So that's good. And I got that down. So really all I'm missing is the rest of it. Twice something. And I think that's similar to part C. Remember part C said triple something. So twice something is, it's the same thing as saying double something. So I'm going, I'm going to multiply two times whatever follows the word twice. So let's see, what am I, what am I doubling here? The number of days since Sally's birthday, and hey, that was X. So I think that makes sense. It's 11 more, okay, got that. You're adding 11, then twice, okay, multiplying by two, by the number of days since Sally's birthday. Okay, I think this looks good. Although you know, you probably know, if you were to check this answer in the back of the book, you probably wouldn't see this multiplication symbol here. You probably just see 2x plus 11. That's probably a nice, more simplified version of this. I just kind of put that multiplication symbol there just so I know that, you know, I'm multiplying. But it should be clear to some, whoever's reading this that 2x means 2 times x. So I think we're good to simplify it to just 2x plus 11. All right, we're doing great, I think. We're, yeah, I think we're getting there. We're having a good time, hopefully. Well, or not a terrible time, I hope. Let's see, almost done. Four times something. I mean, that, this one seems complicated too. Four times the difference of blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I think a lot of times when they get complicated and you try to write it all down at once, it's easy to make a mistake or get confused. So I would, as, as these get complicated, I would do like we did in the last one and say, I'm going to dissect this. It says four times something. I'm just going to stop there and say, all right, four times something. Four times something. Okay, what are we multiplying by here? The difference, even the word difference, that's something, that's a key word for subtraction. So that's that's another thing. I think people people have a hard time with word problems, especially like, like this, because there are key words that, I don't know, aren't clear, and you don't see them very often, so it's easy to forget what they really mean in math language. So again, yeah, difference is something minus something. So they're probably going to tell us what's being subtracted here. And you know, the, and the phrasing of this is kind of confusing too because they said four times something. That means whatever follows the four times, the whole thing is multiplied by four. So I got to be careful and I better put parentheses because if I didn't put parentheses, it would just look like four is being multiplied by the thing before the subtraction sign. But it's really meant to be multiplied by everything that follows the words four times. So i got to be really careful. Um, let's see, they're saying the difference of what? A number, 
I guess I'm assuming a number is the thing we don't know. That's x. <clears throat> and then 7. Okay, and the only good news here is that when they say the difference of something and something, they're, they're, they're nice in that the thing they say first is on the left, so the number is x. And then the same thing they say second should be on the right. But it's very confusing, so be careful because this is not the same as, it's not equal to 4x minus 7. This would imply only 4, 4 is only multiplied by x and not the 7. But the way the problem kind of describes it, it sounds like it's supposed to be 4 multiplied by this whole difference, not just the x, but the difference between x and 7. That's why you definitely want to keep it in parentheses, just to indicate to someone, okay, you guys, it's 4 times the whole thing, x minus 7. So be a little careful there. All right, the next one. I think we've seen this phrasing before, up at the top, uh, further um, up. 5 less than something. I'm just going to stop there so I, I don't confuse myself. 5 less than, that's something minus 5. That sounds like the very first one we did, part A. All right, so what do we have 5 less than? The product. Product means multiply. So that's another tricky word that maybe you, you know, you're not familiar with or you kind of forgot. The product of two numbers. And the two numbers, this is a kind of tricky one because both numbers are things I don't know. Because I know if it's 5 less than the product of something, but what are these two numbers? That's tricky. Well, I'll call it one of them x, and then the other one, you could be interesting and call it something, a crazy variable, but I, I don't know, I'm boring like that, so I'm just going to call it y. So the product of two numbers, you're multiplying them, x times y. And you can put a little multiplication symbol in there, or you don't have to. It looks simpler without it, so I'll leave it out. And that, 5 less than that. That's pretty complicated. These probably here are probably as bad as they get. Um, so if you, if you can do these, then you'll be fine. All right, next one. This one, this is a good one because a lot of word problems talk about some, some certain percent of a number. And I think it's easy to forget how that works. How do you find, for example, they're talking about 16% of something. So they want 16% of... They're saying last month's projected growth. <laughs> Again, they didn't really give me enough information. I don't know what that is, so I'm calling it x. But this isn't really an algebraic expression. I shouldn't see any words in it. <laughs> As you know, I still have the word of. I've, I've kind of simplified this expression here to a number, percent symbol, the word of, x. But I should write it as just something, you know, multiplied by something or something, subtract something. So i got to remember, how do you find 16% of something? That's tricky. Well... Now remember that you take the decimal, even though there's no visible decimal, there's an invisible decimal to the right of 6. You move it twice to the left so that it becomes the decimal form of the percent. So the decimal form of the percent 16 is 0.16, and then you multiply it by whatever you're trying to take the percent of. So for example, you know, if they said, oh, I want 16% of, I don't know, 20. If that's an actual specific specific number, you would find it by going, okay, so 0.16 times 20 is something, you know, some, some actual number you can use your calculator for. But here, since we don't know what we're taking the percent of, we just have to kind of keep it general. So that's, again, that's probably as bad as they get. It's just good to practice those. Even if you don't feel perfectly comfortable with them, the more of those you see, the better you'll get at it. I know people don't believe me when I say that, but it's true. All of a sudden you'll say, oh my gosh, I'm really good at this now. I'm a master. Why don't I just teach math? All right, that might be you. You never know. All right, these are even more exciting because we're going to translate almost kind of a similar thing, except they're going to be equations, so there'll be an equal sign. Let's see. So we got the same idea, though. I'm going to just read a little bit at a time. Like, here we got 15 more than. Okay, 15 more than. I think we saw that language above. That means you're adding 15 to something, so you're adding it on the right side. Um, then... Of what number? Oh, no, sorry. 15 more than what number? Well, I guess I'm going to call that x, right? Every, anything you don't know, you're calling x. 15 more than what number is? Okay, this is a key thing to remember for when you're setting up a word problem or an equation. The word is is code word for equals. So remember that. That's probably something you've seen before. If not, it's good to keep in mind. Because you see the word is a lot in word problems, and yeah, it'll come up a lot. So just remember that when they say is, that means equals. So 
15 more than what number is or equals. And, whoops. And I think the rest of it's probably not a mystery as to what, what to do. You say, okay, is what? 32. Oh, okay. I'll write the number 32. And that's it. And then if you want to kind of check, just read over the words. Say, okay, 15 more than... Okay, that looks right. What number? Okay, yeah, that's the thing I don't know. I called it X. Makes sense. Is equals 32. All right, got it. I think it looks good. I know you're probably going to be very tempted to <laughs> solve this equation, but again, because this is review, we're going to pretend like we don't know how to solve these yet. I'll say, what do you mean? That's for chapter two. We don't know how to solve that. That's crazy. Even though you can probably guess a bunch of X values until you get the right one. Anyway, so just setting it up is the main thing, even though it kind of kills me. I want to solve it, but got to hold back until chapter two. Let's see. This one sounds more interesting. It's got money. Everybody loves money. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Let's see. A carpenter charges $35 per hour. Okay, sounds good. They want to know how many hours did she charge if her bill... If Wait, if she billed a total of three... Ooh, that's a lot of money. 3640 Wow. Let's see. This one's a real thinker because it's not like... They're not really spelling it out for us in this problem. They're not saying, you know, 35 more than a number is something, something... You kind of got to think about, okay, if someone charges you $35 an hour, and then let's say they work X hours. I don't know how many hours it is, so I'm going to call it X. I guess, how would you figure out how much they're going to charge you? So let's say, for example, they work 10 hours. Okay, they work 10 hours, so how much would they charge you? Well, it'd be $35 per hour, 35 times 10, the number of hours. So I, I kind of brainstorm and think about an example, and I realize... 35 times the number of hours. That should be how much they're charging me. Whatever, yeah, whatever the number of hours is. But they're also saying that the number of, or the, the total bill was 3,640. So on one hand, I know that I'm going to be charged $35 times the number of hours. But on the other hand, I know I'm being charged 3,640. So those must be equal. I just got to figure out, you know, 35 times what is 3,640. But again, I'm holding back, trying not to solve that now. That's for later, chapter two. My job is just to set up an equation here. That's someone else's problem now. I don't know whose problem, but someone's. All right. That one was tougher because, again, I had to do a lot of brainstorming and thinking about it. Let's kind of see one more of these, and then if you're getting bored, I'm sorry. We'll move on and try some other stuff. I know this video is kind of long, but... Again, it's, it's for people, if you haven't seen this stuff before or it's been a long time, you're going to really need this refresher. All right, so in 2009, again, that's, a, that's what we call a red herring. They give us that number, that's not going to help us at all, but it's just kind of there to confuse us. It's a number, and you think, okay, this is a math class, so you're probably going to use all the numbers. Not necessarily. Okay, in 2009, the average commuting time to work in New York was 31.4 minutes. All right, that sounds about right. The average in North Dakota was 15.4 minutes shorter. Okay, I thought they were going to say it was just 15.4 minutes, but they're saying we're not going to tell you how many minutes it is. It's 15.4 minutes shorter than New York's commute. So how long was the average commute to North Dakota? I guess i got to think about the word shorter. What do you think that means, shorter? Hmm... Well, maybe first thing... I think if I'm ever confused, I'm not sure how to set something up, I'm going to say... Let me let x, or whatever your favorite variable is, be the thing that they're asking for or the thing you don't know. So the, what they're asking for is, how long was the average commute in North Dakota? Okay, let's see, the number, I guess I'll say it's the number of minutes for a commute in North Dakota. You know, you don't have to be real fancy and write all the words out, just as long as you know what it means. Okay, so they're saying... I guess the first number they gave us was 31.4, right? Okay. 31.4 compared to North Dakota, 15.4 minutes shorter. So I guess, what does that mean? North Dakota, which is X, is, or was, I guess think about the word was, that's, that's past tense for is. And is, now we know, is a code word for equals. So the commute to North Dakota is, or was, 31.4 but not that, they want it to be shorter than, 15.4 minutes shorter than. You think so? I think that makes sense. I think <laughs> this problem, as a matter of fact, 
it's probably easy for you to just come up with how long someone's commute was to North Dakota just by using logic rather than trying to set up the equation. I think that's actually harder than figuring out how, how long the commute was. So this one's probably a lot tougher than it needed to be. This one, it's just, yeah, they just kind of wanted us to practice um, setting these up. So I'd say don't, maybe don't worry about part C so much because, again, this one's almost silly. You, you could figure it out just by using logic rather than setting it up. I'd say probably parts A and B are more important. I'm going to put a little happy face by those guys and a little meh face by these guys because they're, or the last guy because he's not that important. Just good to practice. All right, moving on. Sorry, if you're bored, moving on. Um, let's see. We got properties of real numbers, which these are probably things you already knew, but it's always good to refresh. Um, the first one says here you have A plus B is the same or equal to B plus A. So what do they mean by that? They just mean, you know, if you take numbers like 5 plus 3, for example, that's 8. And then if someone said, whoa, guy, what if you switch those two? Wouldn't that be crazy? What about 3 plus 5? And you look at them like, what are you doing? That's the same thing. What, you know, what's your problem? You know, so anyway, it doesn't, doesn't matter what order you add them in or um, whatever it is. And then the same thing with multiplying. If you were to go, well, what about 5 times 3? Okay, that's 15. But if you were to switch the 5 and the 3, that wouldn't affect the product at all. 3 times 5 is the same thing. Probably learned that, you know, I forget what grade you learn your multiplication tables in. But you probably were all excited like, hey, I already memorized what 5 times 3 is. Now I don't have to worry about 3 times 5. Let's see, what else? This one, this one kind of, it just involves three numbers. They're saying, if you're adding three numbers together and you were to focus on the second two, let's say you add the second and the third, and then when you're done, you add the first. It doesn't really matter. You could have added the first and the second and then added the third. So um, let's see, an example of that. How about if you had two plus parentheses, three plus seven. Okay, what would that be? The parentheses are there to say, I want you to add these first. What's that? 7 plus 3, 10. And then add 2 to that. 10 plus 2 is 12. All right. But they're saying the parentheses didn't really matter. They could have been around the first two guys. 2 plus 3 and then the 7. Because, okay, if you add those first, 2 plus 3 is 5. 5 plus 7, it's still 12. So it didn't really, you know, if you have three numbers adding together, it doesn't really matter which two you add first and then add the third one, as long as they're all added eventually. And then you have the same thing with multiplication, actually. Um, we can use the same numbers. We'll do 2 times parentheses, 3 times 7. That would be, okay, parentheses tell me to focus on the inside. 3 times 7 is 21. 21 times the outer 2 is 42. All right, let's see if I switch those parentheses around here. 2 times 3 first, and then we'll multiply by 7. I'll focus 2 times 3 is 6. 6 times 7 is 42. Yeah, same number. So just be careful, though, because I think if, if people are kind of recalling these properties, if they think back, they'll think, I don't know, they'll be thinking of the wrong operations, maybe. They'll say, oh, what if these were division signs? Or what if one of them was multiplication and one of them was addition? That doesn't go. It has to be all multiplication or all addition. That's the only way these work. So don't, you know, don't try to use these properties when they're not applicable. Um, so those are probably things you already knew, it's just someone spelled them out now, not a big deal. Um, but these are probably more useful. The last one, you can tell it's important because it has a special name, the distributive laws. So that one, you've probably seen that before, it's just saying, let's say you have a number in front of the parentheses, four, there's no, um, and you know, there's no symbol between the number and the parentheses which indicates that you're multiplying. So if you do 4 times parentheses, you know, two things adding together, like 3 plus 1 or something. They're saying if you wanted to, you could distribute the 4 onto either of them. 4 times 3 plus, and then 4 times 1, and then add those things. That's 12 plus 4, which is 16. Um, that's not so useful <laughs> in, in that example because you're probably thinking right now, okay, why don't you just add 3 plus 1? That's 4 and then multiply by the 4. <laughs> okay, good point, but it's probably more useful, let's say if one of those was an x, like, uh, say it was 3 plus x. Well, in that case, you can't really add the 3 and the x, right? Those are not like terms. You don't know what x is. So the best you can do to simplify that is to distribute the 4. 4 times 3 is 12, 
plus 4 times x is, I don't know, so I'll write it as 4 times x. So that's probably where it's mostly useful, and it'll help us solve equations later, maybe in chapter 2 and things like that. Um, the other distributive law is similar. It's almost the same thing. It's just, it looks a little scary because you don't usually see the number that's being distributed on the right side. So, for example, if you had, um, try to mix it up here. How about, I'm so boring. How about C? <laughs> it took me so long to figure out a new variable. <laughs> C plus 2 in parentheses. And let's say you're multiplying by something on the right side, like 6. It looks weird. You know, normally you see this number on the left side, but they're just reminding you this isn't very, you don't see this very often, but it's possible to see it on the right. But you still do the same thing. You distribute 6 times C, so the 6 times the left number, or variable, plus the 6 times the number on the right, 6 times 2, 12. So it seems strange to have it on the right side, but still, it's considered something you would distribute, no matter if it's on the right or the left. All right, we're doing good. We're having a good time. Hopefully, well, hopefully you're not too bored. Um, and if you are, I'm sorry. But hopefully you're learning a lot and having a good time, following along, taking notes, drawing pictures, whatever you want to do. All right, next. Now we're going to go backwards. This is very useful. We're going to eventually we're going to be trying to do more of this in chapter 5, I believe. So this kind of seems maybe silly now, but it'll really help when we get further along. Um so what what they're asking us to do is take this. They're pretty much they're saying here um hey, you see this expression we're given? We want to go backwards. So I guess pr pretend like someone distributed something. This used to be something outside parentheses, something inside parentheses. And you got to figure out, okay, what number or variable was multiplied inside, you know, what was multiplied by both of these guys. So I guess the thing that's going to be outside is what these two have in common. So what does 5x and 5y have in common? Well, they both have a 5, so I'm guessing that's probably what was distributed. Um, and then I guess once I take the 5 out, I say, all right, what was left over from that first term there? It was 5x. If I take the 5 away, x is left. If I take the 5 away from the second term, 5y, y is left. So I think that it, that's it. Let's see, it's 5 outside, x plus y inside. And you know, of course, the, the easy way to check this would be distribute. Let me see if I distribute 5, would I get the original expression? Yeah, 5 times x, that's 5x. 5 times y is 5y. Yeah, that sounds good. So it's just you going backwards. Again, imagine someone has done the distributing for you. And you're trying to go backwards. I wonder, you know, I wonder what the problem used to look like before some someone distributed this. Uh, let's try it one more time with this example. This one seems more complicated because there are three terms. So this one, as we'll see, like I said, in chapter 5, the number of terms you have will mean that you'll have that many terms inside the parentheses. And the good thing is, you notice the signs in between. You see a plus between the first two numbers. It'll be the same in the parentheses. And then you see a minus between the second and the third. That'll be the same in the parentheses. So at least you got the signs down. And then I'm going to look at these three terms. You got 3m, you got 12p, and you have negative 3, or 3. Um, so I think, how about all these guys? What do they all have in common? Well, I know the first and the third have a 3 in common. The middle term doesn't have a 3 obvious, but I know 3 divides into 12. So I'm imagining 3 is probably that common number that was distributed in. And then from there, all I have to do to figure out the three numbers or three variables that are inside is say, well, 3 times what would have made the first term 3m? Well, it would have to be an m, right? 3 times what is 3m? I guess m. And in the middle term, same thing. So what, what here, what would I have to multiply 3 by to get 12p? Well, I know I need a p, because I don't see that variable. But then 3 times what would make 12? It would have to be a 4, right? I think that would work. 3 times 4p would be, yeah, it would be 12p. And then the last term, 3 times what would be negative 3? Well, I guess negative 1. And there's already the negative there, so it's perfect. I think that's it. 3 times, parentheses, m plus 4p minus 1. There it is. And again, if you just want to be careful, let's say on a quiz or an exam or something, you can always check by distributing the 3. If I distribute the 3 inside the parentheses, I will get the same thing that I started with, so I must have done this right. Okay, so if that seemed a little complicated, it's okay. This is more just 
for future. This is going to make chapter 5 a little easier, just having glimpsed it a little bit. Even if it didn't make perfect sense, it's going to make it a lot better. Um, let's see now. So this probably seems silly. If You know, I think fractions is a lot of students' Achilles heel. It's very... It's hard to remember all the properties, you know. Oh, when do I need a common denominator? When do I not? So if, if you already remember all that, this might be a little boring, I'm sorry. But, you know, if you need a refresher, then this is probably a good time to start paying attention. Just kidding. So the first one, this is probably something you know. Um, this one's just saying, if you have a fraction where the numerator and the denominator are the, the exact same number, let's say 4, then that's just a 1. Because again, remember we kind of talked about it a little earlier, if you think of a fraction, it really means the numerator divided by the denominator. So if you think of it that way, then it's more clear. Oh, that's just a 1. Yeah. Or another way to think of it, I know this is silly, but if you go back to way when you first learned fractions, I remember my, my teacher said, what if there's a pie that's cut into four pieces? You know, that's what the numerator's or sorry, the denominator's telling you. That's how many pieces the pie or the pizza is cut, cut into. And the numerator's telling you how many pieces you ate. So I've got a pie that was, or pizza, that was cut into four pieces, and I ate one, two, three, four pieces. Okay, I'm not fooling myself. I ate the whole, you know, I ate one whole pizza or pie. I'm not going to pretend like it was, oh, I only ate four pieces. That's not a lot. It was the whole pizza. I cannot, you know, I can't lie to myself here, all right? Anyway, so if you remember that, sorry if you're, if you're getting kind of bored. Um, the next one, this is just saying if you're trying to multiply two um, fractions, all you have to do is multiply the numerators together, so A times C, whatever that is, A and C are some numbers, and then multiply the denominators together, A times D, or sorry, <laughs> B times D. So it um, probably makes more sense when you see an actual example. Let's say if you had 5, 6 times, I don't know, 3, 7? Sure, why not? I have a lot of students that say, oh, I got to get a common denominator, right? No, you only need a common denominator when you're adding or subtracting. So here, since we're multiplying, we're home free. We can just go ahead and multiply across. You got in the numerator, 5 times 3, that's 15. In the denominator, you have 6 times 7, that's 42. And then at this point, probably you want to see if you can reduce, right? So I got to think, 15 and 42, what divides into both? Well, it's, if you have a hard time remembering, or trying to think of what divides into both, what I do is I look look at the smaller number. 15 is smaller than 42, so it probably has fewer things that divide in. Okay, I think, what divides into 15? I got 3, 5, and 15. Do any of those go into 42? 15 does not, 5 does not, but I think 3 does, so I'm going to try to do that. I think they're both divisible by 3, and then once I do that, I'll be... Fine. 15 divided by 3 would be 5, and then 42 divided by 3 would be 14, I think? Is that right? Yeah, I think so. And that looks good, because the remaining numbers, 5 and 14, there's nothing in common between them. And I, if, you're, if you're good at fractions, or you know, you've, you've seen this stuff recently, you're probably thinking, you know what? You could have reduced while it was here, like while you were here multiplying. If you remember, you see something in common, like I noticed that the 6 and the 3 have something in common. I could have reduced right there. So notice, both of those are divisible by 3. 3 goes into 3 once, 3 goes into 6 twice. And then multiply the remaining numbers together. So what's left here? We got, oops, why do I keep doing that? <laughs> Sorry, you guys. Um, what do we have left? We have 5 times 1, which is 5, and then 2 times 7, which is 14. So it's actually easier to, to reduce while they're just sitting here before you multiply rather than once you multiply, then you reduce. But just so you know, you're going to get the same answer either way. So, looks good. All right. I'm going to erase all this work here so we can have room for the next one. We have division. All right. So, that's a little different. Let's say, yeah, just to, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to use the same example. We have 5 6, but now let's say we're dividing by 3 7 instead of multiplying. So all this is saying, it's not really clear with these letters, but it's just saying you want to flip the second fraction upside down. So the second one here I had was the 7 thirds. Imagine this one was upside down. Instead of 7, or sorry, <laughs> I gave it away, dang it. Instead of 3 7 it's 7 thirds. But the first fraction, the one on the left, stays the same. The second one flips upside down, and now you multiply. So it just kind of takes, you know, um, a division problem and reduces it to a multiplication problem. 
which we know how to do because we just did it in the last example. So now I can, I might try to see if I can reduce, I don't see anything to reduce, right? Five and six have nothing in common. Seven and three have nothing in common. I have nothing in common on this diagonal or this diagonal. I think I have no choice but to multiply across. And remember, you cannot reduce across. Six and three can't be reduced. Unfortunately, reduced. Okay, so I'll just multiply across here. Five times seven in the numerator makes 35. Six times three in the denominator makes 18. Right? Yeah. <laughs> See? All this complicated stuff and the multiplying or the adding is what I have a hard time with. All right. I like that. Sounds good. And then the last property here is saying if you have two fractions added together, but notice they have the same denominator, C. They're saying, all right, if you're lucky enough to come across two fractions that have the same denominator, let's say like 3 fifths plus 2 fifths, for example. You say, oh, jackpot. Those two have the same denominator. That means I do not have to find a common denominator. This is just saying that, okay, you can add the numerators together. 3 plus 2 is 5. But just keep in mind you are not adding the denominators. The denominator stays the same. Don't add denominators. So it's not like, you know, multiply, multiplication, you actually multiply the two denominators. But with addition, you keep the denominator the same. You do not add them. And then what do we got? 5 over 5? Hey, remember from the first property? That's 1. Hey, that's crazy. I guess this one makes sense because if I had a pizza cut into five slices, if I ate three of the slices and later on I ate two slices, I ate five slices. That's the whole pizza because I cut it into five pieces. All right. I don't, I don't try to fool myself. I just eat the whole pizza and you know what? You only live once. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So where are we now? This is the part people usually hate or, well, it's a necessary evil, I guess. Um, what if you have two fractions like these guys? That you're trying to add or subtract, but they do not have the same denominator. They have different denominators. That's a bummer. So if it's been a while since you, you know, you've talked about least common denominators, um, then this is a good way to go about it. But if you already feel like you're, you're good and you already know how to find common denominators, this you don't have to do it this way. This is optional. This is kind of for people that they, it's been a long time since they've seen this or I don't know what. Um... They just never felt comfortable and they want a kind of set way to do it step by step. So let's see, this is saying, what you're going to do first is, especially for these guys, 12 and 18 are kind of larger numbers. And I can't immediately think of what they both have in common, you know, or what's, what's a common denominator for them. If you can, then, like I said, you don't have to really explain how you came up with it. I just assume you're really good <laughs> at math. Um, but if, you know, there are large numbers and you think, man, I don't know, I got to think about this. The first thing I would do is take each denominator and factor it into primes. Do you kind of remember that? So the first denominator is 12. You just say, okay, what times what can make 12? I don't know. First thing that comes to my mind is 3 times 4. But if you started it out as 2 times 6, that would be fine too. And you keep breaking numbers down until you end in all primes. So 3 is prime, but 4 is not. He can keep breaking down to 2 times 2. But th both of those are prime. So I think I'm done. So that means that 12 is... Two, there are two twos, so I'm going to write it as 2 squared times 3. All right, now I'm going to try to do the same thing for the other denominator, which was 18. And then we'll move on to the next step. 18, let's see. The first thing I think of is 2 times 9. But you could have thought of 3 times 6, and that would have been fine. You'd end up with all the same primes. 9 is 3 times 3, and those are primes, so I think I'm done there. That means 18 is 2 times 3 squared, since there are two 3s there. All right, so we got the prime factorizations. Now, step two says, for each prime, take the largest exponent on that prime. Okay, so I notice between these two factorizations, the 12 and the 18, the only prime numbers you see are 2 and 3, right? Here's a 2, here's a 3, here's a 2, here's a 3. There's no other primes than that, so I know all I need is some 2s and some 3s. But as it says, you want to take the largest exponent, so I'm kind of looking... Between, tw okay, 12, let me, let me focus on 2. So here 2 has an exponent of 2. Here 2 has an exponent of only 1. So which one of those is larger? Well, this guy, the exponent 2 is larger. That's how many I want. So when you're coming up with the LCD, just think about, I want to be really greedy here. I want as much as I can get. And then the same with the 3. I notice that 12, it only has 1 3, but the 18 has 2 3s. 
Well, that's definitely more. I want two of them. So that's really what it is. You just look at between them and say, all right, who has more? I'm going to take that many. Just don't make the mistake. I see this a lot where people say, for example, all right, 12, there's one three there, and there's two threes here. Let me add them together. One plus two is three. You don't add them together. You just look at, look at them and say, who has more? I'm going to take that many. So this will be my LCD here. As it says, you multiply those values from step two, and that'll be your LCD. Let's see. So two squared, as you remember, that means two times two. Three squared is three times three. See, two times two is four. Three times three is nine. Four times nine is 36. There it is. So, no, sorry. If you were, if you've already saw that from a mile away, you said, all right, as soon as I saw those denominators, I knew the LCD was 36. Then thank you for bearing with me through this long journey. <laughs> but this is, I guess this process is probably more useful for, um, uh, yeah, for larger denominators. And then again, we'll see this again. This will help. This will help us in chapter six. Because chapter six, we do a lot of the same stuff, but there'll be variables in them. So imagine um, the original fractions had an x and an x squared or something in their denominators. Now we gotta think, gotta think really hard, and I don't know, it's pretty complicated. So it's good to have seen that or seen this process earlier, like now, and then later on it'll be a lot easier. All right, so we got the LCD. Now they want us to actually add those fractions together. So what were the fractions? I already forgot. Five twelfths. Or not adding, come on. You're going to subtract them, because hello, it said subtraction. And we're subtracting 1 18th there. All right. So it's saying, now, you, now that you know the LCD, look at each fraction individually. So for example, the first guy, 5 twelfths. Say, pretty much, what do I have to multiply that denominator 12 by to get 36? 12 times what is 36? 3. So you want to multiply its numerator and denominator by that number. And then... Usually I, I focus on that same one. I say, all right, I'm just going to keep that one going. Um, th 5 times 3 was 15. 12 times 3 is 36. So that's that one. I got that down. Um, how about the other guy? That guy's denominator was 18. Then I asked myself, 18 times what would be 36? Well, 18 times 2 is 36. So that would be the guy. Just remember that whatever you multiply the denominator by, you have to multiply the numerator by as well. So I'll, that would become what? Um, 1 times 2 is 2. 18 times 2 is 36. I hope that's the whole point. Now they have the same denominator. Yay, that only took, what, 15 minutes or something? No. Just kidding. <laughs> and now we can subtract. Like, like we did with addition, you just subtract or add the numerators. 15 minus 2, that's 13. But the de denominators don't go 36 minus 36. It's just the denominator stays exactly the same. So it'll be 13, 36. And I should check, does it reduce? But no, 13 and 36 have, have nothing in common. So that guy doesn't reduce. No problem there. All right, looks good. So let's try another one here. Um, and just maybe just for fun, I'll give you an alternative way to come up with the LCD because that's a little time consuming and maybe that's more useful for really complicated d denominators. But I feel like in this example here, part A, they just want us to add... 7 twentieths and 4 fifteenths. So if you can come up with that LCD really quick, that's, that's great. But if you can't, uh, probably a faster way to do it is think about multiples of each denominator. So, for example, the first denominator is 20. What's 20 times 1? Okay, 20. 20 times 2? 40. 20 times 3? 60. 20 times 4? 80. 20 times 5? 100. All right, it's kind of hard to tell how far to go, but I'll just leave it there. And then maybe I'll look at the same thing, but for the other denominator, 15. 15 times 1, 15. 15 times 2, 30. And you want to keep going until you find one they have in common. So I want to keep going until I see the same number in both of these lists. See, 15 times 3, 45. Okay, not yet. 15 times 4 is 60. Aha, that's the one. That's the one you see in both lists. Yay! So we know the LCD must be 60. That's a lot faster, right? <laughs> oh, well, but I think that, yeah, again, that works probably for denominators that aren't too big. That's a lot easier. All right, so this actually is, these numbers are kind of small. I'm going to write this a little larger so I can see what I'm doing better here. I got 7 twentieths and then 4 fifteenths. Okay. Now all I have to do, now that I know the, de the common denominator is 60, I just have to say 20 times what is 60? Oh, 3. 
Multiply top and bottom by it. That'll become what now? Uh, 21 sixtieths. Gotcha. Okay. We're having a good time here, hopefully. And then same thing for this guy. 15 times what is 60? 15 times 4 is 60. But don't forget to multiply both of those guys by 4. The numerator and denominator. So that guy will become 16 over 60. All right. And now that they have the same denominator, I'm free to add the numerators. 21 and 16 is 37 over. Keep the same denominator. And yay, that one doesn't reduce. That's less work for me. Yay. Okay, calm down, huh? Calm down. All right, that was fun. And then I noticed that part B and part C, we got multiplication and then division, which they maybe they look a little complicated, but just keep in mind with fractions, adding and subtracting is always harder. Multiplying and dividing is always easier. So even though these look might look a little weird, they're going to be a little easier and less time-consuming. So let's see, part B, it looks like we have a whole number, 12, multiplied by a fraction, 5 eighths. I think we saw this a little earlier. You're going to want to write the whole number over 1. And re remember, any whole number you can write over 1. Any whole number can become a fraction as long as you make the denominator 1. And now we're good to go. We can go ahead and multiply across if we want to, remembering that we don't need a common denominator to multiply. But you know what? I'm looking at these guys and I see that... 12 and 8 can reduce, right? What goes into both of those guys? I was thinking 2, but actually 4 goes into both, right? Eh. It's probably easier to reduce now than it is later. So I'm going to say, okay, what goes into both of those? 4. 4 can go into 8 twice. 4 can go into 12 three times. And then I'll just multiply those numbers. The leftover guy, 3 times 5, that would be 15 over the leftovers. 1 times 2 is 2. There it is, and that doesn't reduce anymore. Looks good. All right. Looking good. All right. I like that. How about the next guy? This one looks complicated. That's, that one, sometimes you call that a complex fraction. We'll see more of those in Chapter 6, I believe. Um, that just means it's kind of like you have fractions within fractions. Cause you notice this guy is a big old fraction. And the numerator is its own fraction. The denominator is its own fraction. Holy moly. So it looks scary, but just keep in mind that a fraction bar represents division. So you could rewrite this as the numerator, the big, or the, the fraction in the numerator, divided by the fraction in the denominator. Now that looks a lot easier to handle, right? That's oh yeah. So it's good to keep that in mind that fractions, the fraction bar means division. Sometimes that doesn't help. Like for example, in this answer, if I thought, oh, 15 halves, that's the same as 15 divided by two. Okay, how's that going to help me? Because two doesn't even go into 15. So that's, sometimes it's not helpful, but sometimes it is. So it's good to keep it in mind. All right, now i got to remember, when I'm dividing two fractions, I don't want to be tempted to try to reduce yet. I want to rewrite it as multiplication. Remember, this means the first fraction multiplied by the reciprocal of the second fraction. And reciprocal, if you're not familiar with that word, that just means you take a fraction and flip it upside down. That's now the reciprocal of the old fraction. And I think we're ready to multiply, but I think I want to reduce a little bit while I'm looking at it, because... I think these are going to be big numbers after I multiply, and it'll be harder to reduce. So I notice along this diagonal here, the 4 and the 14 have something in common. 2. I'm going to do that reducing. 2 can go into 4 twice. 2 can go into 14 7 times. And then how about on the other diagonal, I see that 9 and 15 have a 3 in common. 3 can go into 9 3 times. 3 can go into 15 5 times. Ooh, this can start looking messy, so be careful. Write really neat. Let's see, the leftover numbers in the numerator are 5 times 2, that makes 10. And the leftover numbers in the denominator are 3 times 7, that's 21. And that does not reduce anymore. It shouldn't reduce in the end if you reduced all you could in this area. But if this, the end result reduces again, that meant there was something you could have reduced more here that you missed. But anyway... All right, you guys, we're almost at the one-hour mark. Are you having a good time or what? This is like you sitting in class for an hour, falling asleep, hoping that time goes by faster, you know, etc. But at least you could be in the comfort of your own home, right? In your pajamas. That's kind of nice. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. I don't think I'm convincing anyone they're having a good time, huh? Eh, uh, well. All right. So I think we're getting down towards the end here. Don't worry. We're almost done. You guys are holding on, having a good time. Um... Don't worry, not, most of the videos will not be this long. This is just because the whole of chapter 1 is review, and this is kind of all of chapter 1 in one 
long video. I kind of tried to pick and choose the best important things, but it ends up being really long. Sorry about that. Um, the number line, this will be important later when we're solving inequalities, so it's good to know how to place numbers on the number line. Let's see, so I think you've probably seen the number line before. You know, you notice zero's right in the middle. To its right, you see larger numbers, one, two, three, four, and, you know, from there on and on and on, five, six, seven, da 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 And then to the right are all the negative numbers, negative one, negative two, negative three, on and on and on. All right, so if, there are, if you have a whole number or a negative whole number, it's probably pretty easy to figure out where it goes on the number line. But something like this guy, seven halves, it's kind of hard to know. So if you want, what you could do is either change this to a decimal or change it to a mixed number. Do you remember how to change it to a mixed number? If you have a, we call this guy an improper fraction because the numerator is larger than the de denominator. All you have to do is divide the numerator into the denominator. Two goes into seven. How many times? And that seems silly. Two can go into seven three times with one left over. Okay, that means that seven halves is the same as three and one half. So it's, you know, how many times did it go in? Three. The remainder is the new numerator. Three and a half? Oh my gosh, that's so much easier to find. Three and a half should be somewhere a little larger than three, right? Somewhere between three and four. Right about there. Oh yeah, that's a lot easier to find. <laughs> so... If you're ever trying to plot a point or plot a um, a number on the number line that's a fraction, sometimes making it a, a, a mixed number or even a decimal, this means the same as 3.5, that's a lot easier to graph, you know? So about this guy is a little easier, actually, because it's already a decimal. Negative 5.2. Okay, imagine he's somewhere close to negative 5. But let's see, the point 0.2, does that move it to the left of negative 5 or to the right of negative 5? Well, I think, you know, if you think about it, 5.2 is between 5 and 6. So negative 5.2 should be somewhere between negative 5 and negative 6. But it's a little closer to negative 5 because, again, 5.2, yeah, it's, it's not too far away from 5. It's not very close to 6. I mean, negative 6. So I think he's pretty good. All right, I like that guy. Um, how about the last guy? 13 eighths. Ooh, that's one. <laughs> I have no idea where he is. I think I'm going to try to make that guy another um, mixed number. But just remember that you don't divide the denominator, or sorry, you don't divide the numerator into the denominator. It's always the bottom divided into the top. Because remember, like we said, any fraction can be written as numerator divided by denominator. It's always that way. It's never the other way around. So I'll divide 8 into 13. That can only go in once. With 5 left over, right? Yeah. That means that 13 eighths is the same as 1. It's always the number of times it goes in and then the remainder over the old denominator. Oh yeah, that's a lot easier to find. <laughs> I think 1 and 5 eighths. Okay, where's that guy? He's somewhere between 1 and 2. But I think it's a little bit closer to 2 because 5 eighths is larger than a half. So I think he'd be more like, eh, try to show it's closer to 2. I think I made it too close to 2, but oh well. I mean, as long as you're in the ballpark. I think on these problems, what they really care about is, are you even between the right numbers? <laughs> you know, if you play, place that point somewhere other than between 1 and 2, that's when you got to worry. But as long as you placed it between 1 and 2, you're probably good. Don't worry too much. All right, looking good. This is probably... I remember, I noticed that it seems like inequality symbols, less than, greater than, all that kind of stuff. They seem to be things people do not forget. So this should probably be good... You know, easy review for you guys. Uh, but we'll be using these a lot, so it's good to remember. So, okay, what do we got? Inequality symbols. If you see this symbol here, it means less than. If you turn it around, that means greater than. So how about less than? That means the number to the left of that symbol is less than the number to the right. So, for example, 3 is less than 5. But greater than, that means the number to the left, let's say 7, is greater than the number to the right, say, negative 2. Things like that. And then... Less than or equal to, that means the number on the left, let's say 2. It could be less than the number on the right, let's say 4. Or it could be equal to. You could even say 2 less than or equal to 2. And that's true because as long as you're less than or you're equal to, one or the other is enough. So either of these work. It means, yeah, they're both true. And then how about the last guy? Greater than or equal to, it's a similar thing. You could say, okay, as long as the left number, say 6, is greater than the right number, let's say, 2. 
That's true. Or that could be the same number. 6 is greater than or equal to 6. So as long as you're either greater than or you're equal to, then that's a true statement. Alright, so I think you probably remember those. And I'm pretty sure you've seen this guy before. Equal to. As a matter of fact, we saw some of those earlier in this video. Equal to, that just means the left and the right numbers have to be exactly the same. You can't say, for example, negative 3 equals positive 3. Those look similar, but that's not true. Um, not equal to, I don't know if you've seen that very often, but you can say that as long as the left number and the right number are not the same. So I could say 5 is not equal to negative 3. You don't use that very often, it's just, that way if you see that in the book, a lot of times the book uses that symbol, you'll know, oh, the thing on the left is not the same as the thing on the right. Yeah. So how about now, we'll practice. They've got some numbers here, and they want us to throw in the right symbol. There's so many options, they're saying, just use greater than or less than. Don't worry about the or equal to. So how about the first one? Is 1 greater than or less than 7? Okay, it's less than. The hard part is remembering which way that faces. <laughs> less than. You know, if you have a hard time remembering that, remember my teacher, when I learned this, used to tell me that this is like Pac-Man. It's like a less than symbol, you know? See that? You guys are probably too young to know what Pac-Man is, but Pac-Man always wants to eat the larger number. So his mouth's open towards the larger number. He's not trying to eat the smaller number. Come on. This guy's greedy. So anyway, somehow that helped me remember which way <laughs> which way's which. I know that's kind of silly, but whatever. And then how about in part B? Which one of those is larger? Four or 3.54 or 3.45? Well, 3.54 is larger. I'd rather have $3.54 than $3.45. I'm petty like that. So since the number on the left is larger, Pac-Man would be opening his mouth towards that number. He's hungry. Yeah, you don't have to finish Pac-Man, but that's okay. And how about part C? We got, you know what? Those numbers, they look interesting, like 1.2 and 0.9, but they don't really matter. I know that a negative number is always smaller than a positive number, so Pac-Man will be eating the positive number. It'll be opening towards the larger guy. So, if, yeah, that's for, the, for me, those are the easiest. When one's negative, one's positive, it's easy for me. I know, all right, it's always going to be opening towards the larger one. But these one, I think these are the most difficult right here. Negative 3, something, negative 5. Okay, what if those were po or positive numbers, you know, if there was 3, something, 5? Five. Well, five's larger, so it'd be 3 less than 5. But for negative numbers, it's actually the opposite. And if you're ever stuck, you know, you're like, I'm not really sure how to say which one's larger, which one's smaller. If you place them both on the number line, let's say, here's 0, 1, 2, 3, or sorry, 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. Negative 3 is here, negative 5 is here. Whichever one's further to the left on the number line is the smaller one. So since negative 5 is further to the left, that's smaller. That means negative 3 is larger. So it's kind of tricky. Or, like I said before, you know what? Money always makes things make sense, so I ask myself, I have, to, oh, I have to remind myself too that negative means you owe. So would you rather owe, or is it better to owe $3 or owe $5? Ooh, it's greater to owe $3 or better, you know, than $5. Anyway, somehow money makes it make sense. Is that weird? Maybe. Okay. So we're almost here. It's, it's tough with fractions. Here we have 5 twelfths and 3 eighths. Hmm. Which one's larger? That one, you know, if you have access to a calculator, it'd be easy, because all you have to do is make each of them a decimal. And decimals are easier to tell if they have, you know, or if, um, which one's larger than which one. But let's say, you're, you know, you're on a deserted island, and you're hungry, and some local offers you a coconut if you can tell them which one's larger, but you do not have a calculator on you. What do you do, you guys? Well, the one thing you could do, because coconuts are delicious, is you could try to get them to have the same denominator, you know? Imagine you're not, you're, you're adding these or you're subtracting these. Even though you're not, just imagine you are and you want to find a common denominator. So let's see, if we use our old tricks, the least common denominator between 12 and 8 is 24. So I'm going to multiply each of them by what they need to get a denominator of 24. This guy needs a 2, this guy needs a 3. And I think it'll be easier to compare. So this guy will become a... 10 24ths, this guy will become a 9 24ths. Oh, I can see which one's larger now. 10 24ths is larger than 9 24ths, you son of a gun. Not you guys. I'm talking about the fraction. So it's greater. 5 12ths is greater than 3 8ths. Hmm. Some of those are kind of tricky, huh? 
yeah, but again, you're welcome. If you're on a deserted island, you're on Jeopardy or something, you want to know which one's larger, bada bing, bada boom. All right, anyway, don't worry. We snuck in a little bit more fun up here. How about these are just pretty easy if you know, just as long as you know what these symbols mean. Is it true that five is less than or equal to five? Yes, true. It's because even though it's five isn't less than five, it is equal to. So as long as you're equal to or you're less than, this is a true statement. How about this guy? Even if you say this out loud, I think that gives it away. Negative seven greater than? No, four. This negative seven is not greater than four. Is negative seven equal to four? No! That is the most false thing I ever heard in my life. All right, I like those problems. Those are pretty fun, okay. It's all right, we're almost done, you guys. Thanks for bearing with me. Hopefully you're having a good time. Keep in mind, the videos will not be that long. <laughs> this is just because chapter one is really long. Um, this is probably something you remember, like terms. So like it says, in order to add or subtract terms, they have, must be like, which means they must have the same variable or variable bulls. Or like in part A, for example, you see that this three here, or negative three, has no variable. So the only thing that it can combine with is the, another number that has no variable, like four. So those two can combine. You got negative three plus four. That makes one. Those are like terms. And then here you got an eight x. So that guy can only combine with something that has an x. And it couldn't have anything else other than x. Like if this term had a x, y, for example, it couldn't combine. It has to be the exact same variable, no more, no less. But thankfully they're not being that mean to us right now. Maybe later they will be. So I think we're able to add, add or subtract these guys. So okay, we got 8x and negative 10x. So all you're doing really is you're adding or subtracting their coefficients, which are the numbers in the front. So all I have to do is say, all right, 8 plus negative 10 is negative 2. And you keep the variable the same. You don't say x plus x is x squared or anything like that. Just keep in mind, only the number in front of the variable changes. It's not the, it's not the variable itself. And that kind of looks complicated. You know, if you see a plus and a minus next to each other, a plus and a minus just make a minus. There's no need to write it both. This looks a lot simpler. 1 minus 2x. That's a good-looking answer right there, my friends. All right, we're having a good time here. I know I am. I don't know about you guys. All right, how about the next one? I see a constant term. Remember that word? Might as well use the parlance of our times. M, negative 7 and negative 12. Those guys can get together. They're like terms. That makes negative 19, if I'm not mistaken. And what else do we have here? 10.5p. Come on, I gotta throw decimals in there, really? Come on. And then you're subtracting 11.5p. So they both have p's, that means the answer is gonna be something p. All I have to do is figure out 10.5 subtract 11.5. That'd be negative 1, right? Hey, I like that, okay. As long as it wasn't something ugly. And that, you know, that can be simpler, because. You know, if you ever have a variable times 1, anything times 1 is just that number. There's no reason to write negative 1p. You can just write negative p. Yeah, I think that's one of the properties. I don't think we wrote it down, but that's a good thing to keep in mind, that 1 times anything is just that thing. So this right here, if you left it like this, it would be considered not simplified. It's kind of, you left it undone or something. It's almost like leaving a fraction unreduced. If you said, oh, 4, 6 is my answer. Someone would say, okay, yeah, that's right, but you didn't reduce it, so it's not, it doesn't look as good as it could. Okay, don't worry, we snuck another one in. Yay! There's a lot of terms in that one. That's how you know you're having a good time, though. All right, so where are some, I usually just look from left to right. I say, all right, who's the first guy I see? 8T. All right, so he can only add with other things that have a T. Okay, the first, second guy has a T, 2T. This 14 does not, he'll hold out on that one. 5T. 90. Oh my gosh, that's a lot. You know what you could do if you want is kind of write the thing, write the like terms next to each other. If it seems like, oh, that's a lot of things to add or subtract, you can always rewrite it real quick. Okay, that's 8t. And then right here I have minus and negative 2t. I'm going to simplify that, write that as plus 2t. Why am I trying to confuse myself? So, and then the same thing here, you got two negatives next to each other, that just means positive 5t. The last one, though, negative 9t, there's only one negative sign, so it doesn't go away. It's only if there are two of them. I think that's going to be a lot easier to combine now that I've written it like that. And then I've got, the only two terms left are like terms. Negative 14, maybe I'll write that guy down here. And then positive 53. 
I could have probably added those. I don't know why I wrote them again, but just for fun, right? For funsies. All right, now what do we have here? 8t and 2t, that's 10t. 10t plus 5t is 15t. 15 minus 9 is 6t. All right, so we got 6t. And then plus what's going on here? 53 and negative 14 is 39, I think. Is that a true story? I think so. All right. Yeah, we're having a good time, guys. We're almost done, which is kind of making me sad. Oh. <laughs> You're going to like these problems. You, I think if you're good with negative numbers, you're going to have a good time. It's all right. This is just asking you, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> 7 multiplied by negative 4. I think they're just wanting to test you. You know, do you remember, is the result a negative number? Is it a positive number? Of course, a positive number times a negative number is a negative number. And then you're just going to multiply the two numbers, 7 times 4, 28. There it is. And here we have a negative number times a negative number, which is a positive number. So if you want, you can kind of focus on the negatives. Negative times negative is a positive. And then just ignore the negatives now that I've figured that out. 2 times 11 is 22. That's usually kind of how I do it in my head. I don't really go negative 2 times negative 11 is bleh. I first think about what the sign will be in the end, and then just ignore the, the negatives and focus on the numbers. And then same thing on this one, except fractions. So I know my answer will be negative. And I know this is kind of a small, small writing, but... You notice you have a 4 and a 2, so that's going to reduce to what? We can reduce, 2 goes into 2 once, 2 goes into 4 twice, and then go ahead and multiply across. So what do we have left? Negative 1 times, or sorry, 1 times 1 on the top, 2 times 3 on the bottom. And I've already taken care of the negative early, so that didn't, you know, didn't make a big difference. All right, looking good. Let's see, part D. At first I got scared, you know, I said, oh my gosh, 25 times 431, are you kidding me? And I was going to go off to the side and try to calculate that, 431 times 25. But then I saw, oh, times 0? Yay, that makes me so happy. Because it doesn't matter what 25 times 431 is, anything times 0 is 0. So the answer is 0. Yay, forget doing hard work. Why would I do hard work when I don't ha want to? Yay, you guys. Okay, sorry, calm down. Calm down. How about the next one? Are you having a good time or what? I know you're probably thinking, why didn't we lead off with this stuff? This stuff is awesome. I can hear you, and I'm picking up what you're laying down, you guys. Okay, how about this guy? 5 divided by negative 1. So keep in mind, division of negatives acts the same as multiplication. So just like a positive times a negative is a negative, a positive divided by a negative is a negative. So I've taken care of the negative part. Now I just have to say 5 divided by 1 is what? Okay, I can handle that. 5. And then here you have a negative divided by a negative. That's going to be a positive. Now all I have to worry about is what's 18 divided by 3? And again, this is a fraction, but keep in mind you can think of it as division. 18 divided by 3 is 6. Yay! And you don't have to put the positive if you don't want. You can just write 6. And the next one, we've got negative 50 divided by 5. Well, it's a negative divided by a positive, so it's a negative. 50 divided by 5 is 10. Beautiful. Okay, now the next one, this is where it's easy to get mixed up, I say. Okay, 0 divided by 7. Okay, is that undefined or is that 0? I know one of these guys is undefined and one of them is 0. But I guess if you ever get stuck, just write it as division. Is it possible to divide 7 into 0? Yeah, 7 into 0 is 0. So it's okay to have 0 in the numerator or to divide into 0. This is the bad guy. Negative 3 divided by 0. That doesn't make any sense. It's undefined. Yeah, so remember, 0 in the denominator is bad. Denominator is... Wah, wah, wah. Someone told me that if you divide by 0 or you put 0 in the denominator, the world blows up. So don't try to do it, you guys. It's scary. You don't want to be responsible for that. That's a lot of responsibility, you guys. All right, almost done, I promise. <laughs> this is the last stuff. All right. Order of operations, that's everybody's favorite. This stuff is, is definitely worth refreshing because people forget it. And then they'll just kind of like, in the part A, they'll just go left to right and start doing things. And you'll get the wrong number in the end. And you're thinking, wait, 
I did all the operations right. Yeah, you probably did the operations right, but you did them in the wrong order, so be careful. So what, like it says here, you want to focus on the parentheses first. So if there are parentheses in your expression, you want to focus on those guys. Let's see, so I have 8 minus 2 times 3. That's what I'll focus on. This will be the last thing I do, is this negative 9 divided by 3 stuff. But within the parentheses, you notice that there's a subtraction sign and a multiplication sign. So even though I'm focusing on the parentheses, I kind of have to start another order of operations inside there. And I have to ask myself, which comes first, subtraction or multiplication? So I'll consult my order of operations. Looks like multiplication comes before subtraction, so I better do that first. And if you want to be careful, I just probably not try to do two steps at once. I just do one thing at a time. So I'd leave the 8. 8 minus, and then what? 2 times 3 is 6. And don't try to do anything else just to be safe, you know? I'm going to leave everything else for later. All right, that looks good. So what's the next thing I should do? Well, I still have things to do in the parentheses. As it says, focus on the parentheses first until they're all simplified. So I'm going to do that next. 8 minus 6 is 2. All right, I got that. And you know, at this point, now that I've narrowed those parentheses down to one number, I don't really need parentheses anymore. I can just kind of get rid of them. You could leave them if you wanted to, but they're not really there for any reason anymore. They were only there to tell you, focus on this thing here until it's down to one number. All right, now what's left is kind of what we were talking about before. <clears throat> Subtraction is left and, and oops, not multiplication. Division is left. So who, which one comes first in the order of operations? Division comes before subtraction, so I better do that first. I'm going to leave the 2 the same and simplify. 9 divided by 3 is 3. And this is the best part because there's only one thing left to do, so I don't really have to consult the order of operations at this point. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. Yay, that was totally worth all the effort. Yeah. Okay, calm down. Huh? But if you did that in any other order, you'd probably get the wrong number. So be really careful on those, as you probably know already. All right, let's try the next one. So it looks like the next one has parentheses as well. I'm going to simplify that until it's just one number, and then I'll try something else. So I'm going to keep everything around it the same. The 7 minus and the third power, or exponent of 3, and the plus 4. All that's going to stay the same. But I'm going to focus on what's inside there. 3 minus 5, that would be negative 2. And you know what? This looks kind of confusing. So I think, because I'm not sure what's being raised to the third power here. Whenever you have a negative left over, I'd leave it in parentheses, because that it's good to know that the three, the third power is, is is being raised on not just the two, but the negative as well. So I think maybe leaving things in parentheses, even in the last one, it's not a bad idea. It didn't really help me in the last one, but it's saving saving me right now in this problem. Okay, so I can't really do much more with the parentheses. All that's in there is negative two, so I'm going to move on. I've already looked at parentheses, now let's look at exponents. There is an exponent, so I better take care of that first. And remember what that means. Negative 2 to the third power. That means, let's see here. Oh, hello. That means negative 2 multiplied by itself three times. So what would that be? Negative 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. Or sorry, positive 4. Positive 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. Ah, oh, so this is negative 8. Be careful. And I'd probably put that in parentheses as well. i got to remember... There was already a subtraction sign from before. It was already in front of the parentheses. And there's another one because negative 2 to the third power is a negative. So be careful. And then now, we're just down to, we got subtraction and we got addition. And notice in the order of operations it says, addition and subtraction, they have the same, uh, I don't know, the same priority. It's just you have to look from left to right. So since the subtraction comes first, when I look from left to right, I'm going to do that first. Although, if you think about it, this is two negatives, right? Or a negative subtracting. So it really becomes a positive. It's really 7 plus 8 plus 4. And if you want to be a stickler, you could say, I have to add those first. That's 15. And then add the 4. But, you know, when it's all down to addition, you can just add them all together if you want. It must be 19. Aha! Very tricky, you guys. Very tricky. All right, this is fun. If only maybe there were, like, two more of these. Oh, look, there are. Yay, there are two more. Whee! All right, calm down. These are getting pretty complicated, actually. But as long as you're careful, you're going to have a good time. Let's see here. We could probably go a little faster because, I don't know. I 
think we've seen a few of these by now. All right, so I noticed this problem in part C, it has brackets and parentheses. So I'm supposed to focus on the brackets first. You know, I've got these, this, I better simplify this down to one thing. But within those brackets, I have to start a new order of operations. So within those brackets, do I see parentheses? Yes. I have to focus on that first. And then after parentheses are done, then the exponent, then multiply, divide, then yada, yada, you know. You know the drill. So I'm going to leave for now 8 minus 4. I'm just going to subtract the two numbers that were inside the parentheses. So it was 9 minus 10. That's going to make a negative 1. All right. So those parentheses are nice and simplified, but now I need to square, or re raise that to the second power. Because within these brackets, that's the next thing order of operations tells me to do, is raise that negative 1 to the second power. So remember, that means negative 1 times negative 1, which is positive 1. Yeah, just remember, I'm going to write it off to the side. Negative 1 squared, that means negative 1 times negative 1, which is positive 1. All right, now we're still kind of fo focused on the brackets here. Within the brackets, I see subtraction and multiplication. And for sure, with order of operations, multiplication comes first. So I'm going to focus on that. Leave the 8 alone for now. 4 times 1 is 4. All right. We're doing pretty good, I think. Now, we'll still try to focus on the brackets until those are simplified as they can be. And since there's only one more operation to do inside those brackets, I think that's all I can really... It's not really mu much of a choice. We'll just subtract those two. 8 minus 4 is 4. Okay. And now we're kind of we're done with the parentheses part of the order of operations. There are brackets left, but there, there's nothing to do inside of them. The next thing I want to do is move on to exponents. I do see that there are some exponents to, com to simplify here. I've got 2 to the third power. And it, since there are two different exponents, I probably just calculate them from left to right. 2 to the third power, that means... 2 multiplied by itself 3 times, which is 8, oops, plus, I think I'm going to be a stickler here, just to be safe, leave 2 to the 4th power the same for now, and then I'll focus on that guy, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, 4 times, that guy would actually be 16, because 2 times 2 is 4, times another 2 is 8, times another 2 is 16, all right, leaving everything else the same. Now it's left. We've got parentheses done, exponents done. Multiplication, no, there is multiplication to do here. Even though that looks strange because there's, you know, there's brackets. Just remember when two numbers are next to each other like this, with no obvious operation, it's automatically going to be multiplication. So I'm multiplying the 5 times the 4, and I'm getting 20. All right, looks good. Is it What's in between them? Addition or subtraction? Subtraction, because it was a negative times a positive. All right, at this point, it's down to addition and subtraction, which the order of operations told us, just look from left to right. We'll do this first. 8 plus 16 is 24. And then when I'm done with that, I'll subtract that 20. And I think I can handle that, right? That's probably, probably the best part of this whole problem is the very end of it. That would be 4. Yay, all that work for a measly 4, you guys. Yay. Don't worry, there's one more that looks super fun. Is that how you would describe it? Sure, why not? Um, okay. This one looks complicated. But just remember, if it's a big old fraction like this, you got all kinds of order of operation stuff going on in the numerator, all kinds of order of operation stuff going on in the denominator. Um, I would just say simplify numerator, you know, until, you, until it's all down to one number. Until... It is one number, and then do the same to the denominator, same for denominator. And then, you probably, and then you'll just have a fraction, which you could see if it reduces or not. So you know what you could do if you want is, I might just focus on the numerator for now. I'm just going to go, all right, forget that denominator. It's going to sit there. It's going to confuse me. Let me focus on that numerator. It's negative 3 cubed, or to the third power, minus 2 times 3 squared, or to the second power. I'm going to see what that is, and then I'll look at the denominator. Just because it's probably easier to look at them separately. There's so much going on here. Parentheses, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Whew. I like the numerator. It's simpler, so I'm going to focus on that. 
Um, but within the numerator, there are no parentheses, so I'll move on to exponents. From left to right, the first exponent I see is 3 to the third power. And you notice that the negative is not in parentheses, so they're just trying to tell you that only the 3 is being multiplied by itself three times, not the negative. So the negative is just kind of hanging out in the front, but the 3 is being multiplied by itself three times. And then we'll figure out what this is over here. So let's see, what's that? Um, 3 times 3 times 3 would be 27. This is 27, and then we'll keep the other stuff the same. 2 times 3 squared. Alright, fair enough. What's left now? We still have an exponent to take care of. I'm going to see what that is. It's 27 minus 2 times 3 squared. Notice the, the second power is only on the 3. So he'll be multiplied by himself twice. But the 2 is not. He's, he's not being raised to the second power, so he'll just stay as he is. So it'll be negative 27 minus 2 times... Let's see, 3 times 3 would be 9. Alright. So what's left to do here? We have subtraction and multiplication. And we know order of operations says multiplication comes first. So I'll do 2 times 9, that's 18. And then the very last thing to do is just combine those guys. That's negative 45, I think? Is that right? Look at it. I know all this complicated math and the subtraction is what I have a hard time with. I know that's sad. I don't care. Okay. How about the denominator now? We're almost done. This is beautiful. We're going to be ready to start the new material in the next video. Getting ready to kick some booty, take some names. Okay, don't get ahead of yourself. I see what you're saying. All right, but we do have some parentheses here. Huh? We better focus on that. And even within the parentheses, we have brackets. So I better focus on the very middle, that part right there. 2 minus 15. That's going to come first because it's the very center of all the brackets and parentheses. 2 minus 15, that would be negative 13. If I'm not too burnt out, huh? Thinking about all this math here. We'll keep all this stuff the same. Looking good, looking good. And I think I'm going to keep this in brackets so I don't confuse myself. Or you, can, you know brackets and parentheses really mean the same thing, so if you kind of don't like brackets, you can always change them to parentheses. Don't, not a big deal. They really, they're just, I think they write brackets and parentheses to differentiate them from each other. Because I think if you saw two sets of parentheses, it would kind of get confusing, sort of. Alright, so it looks like we still have things in the parentheses. I'm going to have to do that before I do anything else, since parentheses comes first in order of operations. We notice that's 6 minus negative 13. That's the same as 6 plus 13. I'm not fooled by that. Come on. Someone's trying to fool me here, and it's not going to work. That'll be 19. Ah, why do I keep doing that? I'm sorry, you guys. So clumsy. That would be 19. All right, looking good. So what's left? You got division, you got exponent, you got subtraction. Definitely exponent comes first. 2 squared, or 2 to the second power, that's 2 times 2. That would be 4. All right, let's see here. So we got 8 divided by 4, and then minus that 19. So the next thing that comes in order of operations is the division. I'm gonna, gosh, sorry guys. I'm gonna do that next. Da -da 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 -da. Quit messing around. My computer is overheating right now. 8 divided by 4 is 2. Minus 19. There's not much left to do but subtract. 2 minus 19. Negative 17. Yay! So we've got the numerator and denominator down. The answer must be the numerator, which we found to be negative 45, over that denominator, negative 17. And even though that doesn't reduce, nothing divides into 45 and 17, it is a negative divided by a negative, so I can say at least it's a positive. Holy shamoly. That was a doozy, you guys. If you can handle that one, I think you can handle any order of operations. You could be a master of order of operations. If they ever had a tournament of order of operations, you could probably kick some booty. I don't know, you guys, try not to cry. This is the end of this video. <laughs> try not to cry, there's another one, don't worry. There are more. Alright, what do they want us to do? Combine like terms. It seems like, you're probably thinking, didn't we just see this? Or we didn't we do combining like terms? They're trying to make it more interesting. They got, notice they have something to distribute here. This 5 needs to be multiplied inside. And then same thing here, you got a 6. So I think they're trying to say, hey, you can combine like terms, but there are some times where you should simplify what you're given and then combine like terms. Okay. Let's see, you got a 15x here, and then a minus y. But then, you know what? 
I, you got to be careful because you don't want to think of this just as 5 distributed in. It's not really a 5, it's a negative 5. So be careful. I'm going to think of negative 5 times 3x, negative 5 times negative 2y, negative 5 times 5z, and that's really what will be going on here. Let's see what will that become. Negative 5 times 3x, negative 15x, negative 5 times negative 2y, that's positive 10y. Be careful. And the last one, negative 5 times positive 5z is negative 25z. Ah. Sorry, my z's are kind of weird. All right, now that everything's all out in the open, real cute, simple, now I can start looking for like terms. See, 15x, there's another x term. Oh, they're going to cancel because 15x minus 15x is 0. Great, all that work I put in for nothing, you know? All right, and then we got a y, or a negative y, and a 10y. Those are like terms, and they won't combine to make 0. Negative y and 10y makes 9y. Because remember, you can think of this guy as like negative 1y plus 10y, and then add the numbers, their coefficients, negative 1 and 10 is 9. And then unfortunately we got this guy here, an odd man out. He doesn't have a friend to combine with. I feel kind of bad, but don't worry, you can hang out with the y. Negative 25z. Just, yeah, so if there's ever a term where, you know, it has nothing in common, or it's not a like term with someone else, eh, just leave him as is, and don't worry, it's not like you did something wrong, that's just, sometimes that happens. All right, we'll try this last one, and again, you try not to cry because this video is over, you guys. There's more to come. All right, what do we have? Negative 8a squared plus 5ab. Yeah, again, these, I'm not going to try to combine like terms yet because the only like terms that might be like with the ones that I just wrote are these guys that are in the parentheses, but since they're kind of trapped in the parentheses, I have to free them by distributing, and again, this one, I'm not thinking of it as a 6, I'm thinking of it as a negative 6 just so I make sure I get my um, signs right. So it'll be negative 6 times 2a squared. That would make negative 12a squared. And I have negative 6 times negative 4ab. That's positive 24ab. I'm just kind of multiplying the numbers in the front, right? Negative 6 and negative 4. And then keeping the variables the same. And then the last one, negative 6 times negative 10b squared. That's a positive 60b squared. Is that true? I think so. All right, looking good, you guys. Having a good time. We've got quite a few like terms here. It looks like negative 8a squared and negative 12a squared. Just be careful. Like I said, keep in mind um, that you're only a like term with someone if you have the exact same variable and the exact same exponent. That's why this a squared and the a squared can combine, but this a and this a squared cannot. So you got negative 8a squared and negative 12a squared, you just add the coefficients. Negative 8 and negative 12, that's negative 20. And you do not change the variable or its exponent. That stays exactly the same. Yeah, when you're adding or subtracting, you don't change exponents. It's only, we'll see later when you multiply or divide, you, you change the exponents. But we're just adding or subtracting. All right, what other like terms are there? You got 5ab, there's a 24ab down the line. Those are like terms. And I'll just add their coefficients. 5 and 24 makes 29. Ooh, that's a lot of ABs. 29 AB. And there's only two guys left here. You got a 12B squared and a 60B squared. Or sorry, negative 12. So I'll combine their coefficients. Negative 12 and positive 60 is positive 48B squared. And that looks good, I think. Don't worry about, you know, turning, you know, changing those terms around. You can just leave them as they are. All right, you guys, sorry that video is so long, but again, you got through the hardest video or the longest boring video. From here on out, good times, shorter videos, a lot more exciting stuff. But thank you for listening. Have a nice day. I'll see you soon.